LBC Brightside, good to see you church. Sorry that it's been a, a couple of weeks, but we've been so busy with the planting of churches, we will now look to get through the book of James. Next week, we hope that chapter 5 will be finished, but today let's finish chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 13 to 17, we're going to work our way through. So, the says in verse 13, Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a silly, spend a year there, buy, sell and make a profit. This is a great picture of a man planning his life without God. If you like, it's an example of practical atheism. It's just someone getting on with their life. Um, without a thought of God, without a consideration of God, without inquiring of God. As Christians, we like to inquire of God. We like to say, God, what is it that you want me to do? God, these next 12 months, where are we going? What are we going to do? Where shall I put my vision? Where shall I put my time? Proverbs 27 verse 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And that is so true. As we go into this next verse, we're going to expand on that. Verse 14. Verse 14, it says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapour that appears for a little while and then vanishes. It's a vapour that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Uh, life is nothing more than a vapour. Imagine a kettle being put on, the steam comes up, you try to grasp hold of the, the steam. When you take your, open your hands, the steam's gone, it's disappeared, it slips through. Life is very much like that steam. It's here for a moment and then it's gone. It's like you can't grasp it. How many of you can remember your, your time when you were in junior school or high school and now you're in your 30s or you're coming up to 40 or maybe you're past 40 or so on and you're saying, where has the years gone? Where has my life gone? Life is like a mist or a vapour that appears for a little while and then as soon as it's there, it's gone, it's vanished. I went to grab it, it's gone. It's, there's a reason. There's a reason life goes so quick. Eternity doesn't, by the way. Eternity doesn't. If all we had was this life and nothing else, it would be pointless. It would be pointless. This, I know, I know there's life after this earth. I know there's life after our time here. But we get a place to choose. We get a place to choose right now. We get to choose. Do I want to follow Jesus or do I not? It's your choice. It's your choice, church. Job 7.7. 7. Job says, my life is just a breath. It's here in a moment, then it's gone. Leonard Ravenhill talked about 24 hours. He said, eight hours you sleep, eight hours you work. What do you do with the other eight hours? I can tell you now that urgency should be a word on the lips of every believer. Urgency, yes, to get your own life correct and your own life in line and right, because tomorrow's not promised you. But urgency for the outside world, urgency for the unbelieving world. Get your life right, church, that they may see a great signpost at the same time. Get your life right with Christ, yes, but now tell the world that he's the way, the truth and the life. If he really is, as you say he is. You should be telling the world, is that very person, is that very one that you claim to hold eternal life in? If you had a, if you had a, a cure for cancer and you told no one about it, it would be one of the most selfish things you could do. To know Jesus and tell no one about him is the greatest, most selfish thing anyone could ever do. And yet at the same time, to the believer listening that says, but I'm not an evangelist. I can't do what you do. I can't do what he does. I can't do what she does. God never called you to be them. We're all called to be witnesses, not all called to be evangelists. What is a witness? First, let your life be a good witness. OK, that's the most important thing I would say. First of all, let your life be a good witness. And then when necessary, share what you need to share. When necessary, speak words as the quote goes. But urgency should be on all of us. 
Verse 15 says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we should live and do this or that. This is just a little change in words, just a little change in words. But it is a big switch in the heart. It's a little change in words, but it's a big switch in the heart. Because what you've just said is over to you, God, over to you, God. You jump in the driving seat, God. I'm passing this all over to you. Not where I want to go next year, but where do you want me to go next year? Over to you, God. The questions now change to what do you want me to do? Or where do you want me to go? All of a sudden, you're like David inquiring of the Lord. You're like the Old Testament prophets inquiring of the Lord. You're like those the early disciples in the early church that knew the voice of God, that stuck so close to Holy Spirit, had that intimacy with God, that they could understand and hear his voice. Smith Wigglesworth who wanted to be a man that so knew the Father that at any moment he could say, Holy Spirit, what would thou have me to do today? And that he'd be able to hear and recognise the voice of God. I want to be a man like that. You should want to be a man and a woman like that. Verse 16, it says, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. You see, human plans apart from God are empty and vain. That's the reality. That's the truth. Verse 17, it says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. This is a key verse for our walk. I say it again. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. It's a key verse to the Christian walk. Sin is not just what we resist. Sin's not just, you know, resist the Ten Commandments and thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. So I don't do any of those things. I've not sinned. Actually, right here, it's saying, look, if you don't ask God for direction in your life, if you don't seek God, if you don't inquire of God, at the very least, at the very least, this is frowned upon. This is frowned upon. And yet, actually, if you just read it for the simple wording that it says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin, Keeping involved the context that we're in, we're talking about direction. We're talking about, God, where do you want me to go? And it's, James is saying, like, don't make plans for yourself without inquiring of God. Your life is a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, seek God. Talk to him. Ask him what you should do. And the final verse says, look, the good you should do, if you don't do it, then you sin. At the very least, not seeking God it would be frowned upon at the very least. But maybe some would be there uh, shouting, actually, it's a, it's a sin not to seek the face of God in what to do next. Let me leave you with a question then. Has God showed you or spoken to you of anything? Has he told you to go somewhere? Has he told you to do something? And at the moment, you still haven't. If that be the case... At the very least, it's frowned upon. At the very most, it's sin, it's disobedience. Um, I don't want God to frown upon me. I'm the kind of person that would just black and white, it's sin or it's not. So for me, if he's asked you to do something, crack on. Ask God for the strength to fulfill the things that he's called you to do. And if we're going to make plans, let's inquire of God. To God be the glory, church. Be blessed speak to you soon. Amen.